Hello, Hidden Gems. This is a very special hidden hour tonight. And yes, it is it is Friday night, not Saturday. So thank you for uh, shifting your schedules if you're planning on Saturday to be with us Friday because we are so honored to have uh, with us Tom Evans. Tom Evans is also known as juror number 18 when it came to the Lori Vallow Daybell trial in Boise, Idaho. Uh, Tom was there every day. I was there every day. We did not know each other. We could not speak. We could not look at each other. We could not acknowledge one another. <laughs> uh, he faced, you faced Lori Vallow every day of trial yeah. and looked directly at her. That's how the courtroom was uh, situated. And where I sat, I looked straight ahead at jurors actually, and had to um, give you guys space and, and only tweet live tweet from my phone as to not cause um typing noises uh but we're so grateful to see everyone here please let your friends know we are here tonight because this is going to be a great conversation this is going to be a conversation among friends uh, we have questions for tom but it's not every day that um, someone with us a guest with us has questions for us and tom has those for us tonight as well uh, specifically dr john so we are going to be talking to lori vallow and chad daybell case tonight but specifically uh tom's experience through tom's lens learning about the case through evidence at trial and tom's we are just experience through tom's lens one second what's that the case through evidence at trial and tom's can you guys hear that yeah we can hear it um, I don't know if that's, is that one of you, the echo that started? Is it, okay. Let's see. I'll figure out who this is. It is still going. I muted Tom and it's still going. John, can you mute yourself? So it's okay. I've unmuted myself and I'm good. I'm unmuting Tom and it's good. So it's nope. Okay. Hold I've on. unmuted myself and I'm good. Okay. I'm but, unmuting Tom and it's good. That was just me. Hold on. Nope. Okay. I've unmuted myself and I'm good. Okay. I'm unmuting Tom and it's good. That was just me. Hold on. Nope. Okay. I'm unmuting Tom and it's good. That was just me. Hello, hello. This is me. Hello. Okay, let's unmute both of you. Okay, it, it wasn't echoing there. I actually don't know what it is. Okay. Um, we had a joke about this. We tested we tested audio for, for 15, 20 minutes. We made a joke. We said, this is what always happens. So everything's too good to be true. And we get on and something happens. So it's got to be uh, me. It has to be. <laughs> It happens every time. We for for fifteen minutes in our pre-show test, everything was great, and then Lauren, I, you jinxed it when you said things are going to go south the minute we get on, and they did. So, but <laughs> did you? Did, I knew I'm you shouldn't have said now. that. <laughs> it's like, uh, yeah, I don't, and I actually don't even know what it was. It, it was the strangest thing. My typical uh, go-to troubleshooting. There was nothing. So, uh, yes, as CC says, sometimes it does that. Thank you for being patient. Everyone has cleared up now, so we should have a good show now that we've gotten rid of that that ghost that wanted to be with us for a bit. So I apologize. But as as I was saying, and we'll turn the time over to Tom because because who we're all interested in right now tonight is Tom. But thank you everybody for being here tonight. This is going to be a conversation among friends. I did hit subscriber only on chat and I made it five minutes. You have to be a subscriber for five minutes before you can join just because this is, we have such a sensitive guest with us tonight. So un please be understanding of that. And our moderators are going to be a little bit more vigilant tonight too um, with Ooh. the chat. So thanks everyone for being here. Tom, John, do you want to, do you want to jump in and, and start talking to 
asking Tom some questions and I'll, I'll take a look at chat and make sure everything's good tech wise. Sure. Um, so Tom, if you're okay, maybe you could just, uh, enter yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself and, we obviously know, I assume that the state of Idaho is like other states and that jury selection is, is random. So presumably you received some type of summons to be on the jury, but then it's an interesting question about, could you tell us a little bit about the process, how you were selected? Sure. Um, so I've lived in Idaho for 20 years. Um, I lived in Northern California before that. Spent most of my life as a contractor. Um, Never expected to find myself on the jury for this case, for sure. And I didn't even know when I went in. I mean, I just got a notice in the mail to come in, so I did. And um took me a while to figure out what case it was for. I, I just <laughs> thought it was business as usual at the courthouse, even though there was a massive jury room. It was probably, I don't know, there was hundreds of people in there, a hundred anyway. And I guess they had like 2,600 uh, call-outs for jurors. Wow. And somehow I ended up being one of the <laughs> ones on the jury. I don't, still don't know how that happened. What could you describe that process a little bit? I presume that both the prosecution, you obviously had to fill out a fairly detailed form describing a lot of things about yourself, right. but the, it would be up to the prosecution and the defense to, to vet you by your answers. Could could you tell us a little bit about that process yeah, for you? The first couple of times I got called in, it was just to fill out some forms. And so I did that and, you know, wasted a few hours getting through that process. And then finally, I think it was the third day, um, I actually got called into court and we were asked questions by Judge Boyce. And um, mostly it was, you know, is this a hardship for you? And, you know, what do you know about this case? And it was kind of going down the line of people toward me. And I was thinking of all the things I could say to get out of this because, <laughs> you know, it's a jury trial. I don't, I don't want to. <laughs> yeah. Know. Some of the hardship cases that I heard before it got to me were pretty real. And mine didn't seem like much by the time it came to me. So I couldn't really, you know, say much about that. But then the next thing was, how do you not know? about this case. And I was just honest. I, I basically just said that I didn't really pay much attention to it because it was sorted. It was sad and it, it didn't catch my interest at all. And also during the COVID years, I spent a lot of time, we have a cabin up in Northern Idaho and I spent a lot of time up there where I have no internet or anything um, building that cabin. So I really didn't know much going in. Okay. So yeah, that was that was a question I was going to ask you. Actually, the, you know, did you did you know anything about the case? Had you had you seen it in the? I presume because you're in Idaho, you must have probably encountered some media talking about the case. I knew of it. I knew what Lori looked like. Um, I knew that kids had been killed, and I think I, I think I knew that they'd been found um, buried in the backyard. That's about it. I don't even know if I really knew that much. Okay. I, re I remember uh, listening to jury selection. We could not see you, Tom, or, or anyone. They made all reporters sit in the overflow that week. But it was, there were so many. And the questions they asked were uh, very repetitive and very detailed. They asked if you had seen the Netflix documentary. Did they ask that? I heard that many times. Yeah. yeah. I think it was the defense attorney actually asked me that one. So, so here's the question. Have you seen it now? Yeah, <laughs> I, I can find on it now. I know so much more about it now than I did when the trial was over. It's ridiculous. Okay. I mean, I yeah. walked out of there still with, with a million questions. Yeah. Well, you know, you and I met, uh, and, and we'll go back to the beginning where John is, but you and I met at the sentencing in Rexburg uh, and even then, you, you know, you're willing to talk to me because I know that the Woodcocks and other people, you know, said, yeah, Lauren's, Lauren's safe. You can talk to her, but you didn't know who I was then. Right. And, and so, but now you, uh, certainly, as you say, you've, you've heard and listened to everything and, 
Oh yeah, everything that I could have, you guys. And actually going to that sentencing turned out to be a great thing for me because I did get to meet you and some other people that I was not expecting that. I didn't know, you know, I just picked a hotel in the town. I didn't know that it was gonna be the one that everybody was staying at. And I was gonna walk <laughs> right into the lobby and there everybody was. So that was great. I, re I remember you were, uh, I think you were interviewing Kate and Larry when I walked in, I believe, and just kind of walked right into the middle of that. Yes. That yes. Yeah. Sorry. Go ahead, John. But yeah. But, but that's what I remember about the jury selection is it was a lot about, have you seen the Netflix documentary? Have you seen the datelines? Have you yeah. seen what is the coverage you've seen? What, what were your answers to those questions? What had you seen? Um, I hadn't seen any of that. I hadn't watched any of the shows. I didn't, like I said, I just didn't pay attention to it. So it, it would be reasonable to say, I always wonder, I'm sure, I'm sure a lot of our gems wonder how to, how they find jurors that are reasonably <laughs> unbiased yeah. in, in situations like this, where a case has, you know, international attention and everyone knows about it. And um, I guess you're helping us answer that question. Well, and that's the big thing at the hearing right now. They're trying to get it moved back to Rexburg. And um, the jury pool there is so much smaller. Right. I, it is even hard for me to believe that out of the 2,600 or whatever the number was, they were able to find 18 who knew as little as I did. Many people say there's no way they'll find anyone that doesn't know about this in Idaho. So yeah, you're you're answering the question, but, but yeah, I I'm surprised they're trying to move it back to Rexburg. It's going to be, be even harder I, now after that trial, right? Right, and even you knew of Lori Vallow, you knew what she looked like, you knew there were some children that were found. Yeah. In Rexburg, that would be harder. So I guess if we're going to find unbiased jurors for Chad's trial. Maybe we need another pandemic then with, with, <laughs> no, with some, <laughs> some cabins with some cabins in the middle of, of you know, beautiful places. Um, yeah. But uh, so so when you 2600 is a, is a huge number of jurors to to that. And um, when you learned you were going to be seated as a juror, how did you react to that or what was your, I didn't what was your response? Realize, I didn't realize we were boiled down to 18. So the last day, I guess the second to the last day, we're sitting in the courtroom. There's, you know, I think there was 42 people in there, it turns out. And they're doing this thing where um, the prosecution would write something down on a piece of paper and hand it to the bailiff. The bailiff would walk over to the defense. The defense would look at it. They would write something down and the, the bailiff would walk it back. This went on for hours and hours. I had no idea what they were doing. I'm just sitting there like brain dead watching this. But it <laughs> turns out that they they can each pick 12 jurors to just send away. for They didn't need to have a reason to do that. So mm -hmm. out of those 42, they sent away 24, and we were down to 18. I didn't know. That, you know. So they're all done. They, they call out some juror numbers and say, you guys can go. Thanks for your service and all that. And so there's 18 of us left in the room. And I just thought I was another group of 18 and there was several other groups still. Um, but then we walked out and the jury, jury administrator, Randy, started talking to us. And then it dawned on me, like I was probably the last one to figure this out. But I was actually on this jury. <laughs> <laughs> and did you, so did you have any idea that this was going to be Lori Vallow's trial then? I mean, you clearly started to think that this was a really big deal. The questions, well, they were asking you some tough questions too about children. Yeah. By that point, of course, I knew. And and so when we when we finally actually went into court for the first time, she was sitting there and I knew who she was. So we walked in, sat down and she's there and she was like looking at each of us, making eye contact. And then it hit me hard. That this is what I'm in for. Okay. That was one of the jury questions too. Can I ask you this? They they asked if you would be able to handle seeing some really difficult things. And I don't know if there was a single person that answered, oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, many people said that would be very, very difficult for them. They're unsure, but they would do their best. Other people simply said, absolutely. 
not no way can, can i ask if you remember how you answered that question I, um, I don't remember how i answered but i know i felt like i was probably as well equipped for that as anybody would be so, yeah that yeah, thank you for sharing that, that. Yeah. yeah so let's so i think this would take us into opening arguments um and it, and this would would dovetail with your book, by the way, Tom. So you're 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 writing a book, you or you're in the pro, you have written a book, I guess, right? And the manuscript is done; it's in the editing right now. And could could you tell us the title of your book? Yeah, it's uh, "Money, Power, and Sex: The Lori Vallow Daybell Trial" by juror number eighteen. Okay, great. And so that brings us into opening arguments, where one of the prosecutors talked about this case being a case of money, power, and sex. Yes. And so when you, so using it in the title of your book would obviously suggest that that seemed like an important moment for you. Um, when you heard that, when you heard those opening arguments and you heard um, the prosecution use that term or describe it in those terms, mm -hmm. what did you, how did you respond to that? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, that didn't have any special significance for me, I guess. I mean, I was just trying to understand what this was going to be all about at that point. I think more than anything, it was, it was, her opening statement was interesting. Yeah. Well, I mean, so, um, what, what were your different reactions to both the prosecution and defense during those opening statements? Um, I, I got the feeling that the, the defense was pretty on the ball. They seemed to have it down pat what they wanted to prove. They seemed pretty sure of themselves. Um, the defense, honestly, they, they, they seemed um, very good. Um, the, both those guys well qualified. I've done a lot of research on them since, so I know what their past is and everything, but two really super qualified public defenders. I don't think you could find anybody better than those guys, but it just kind of felt like they were helpless. They didn't have a lot to go on there. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, I mean, so at the end of those open, it, you know, it, it's interesting to me to ask you these questions because I think those of us who know this case very well before the trial probably had some biases. So, you know, um, so I, I think that, you know, I mean, we, we try not to, of course, but we try to be fairly uh, objective around here, but, but sometimes it's hard to. So I was um, evaluating everything as it was happening because I was so in the dark, I think. Okay. I make judgments on everybody. And One thing I want to ask too, is not only during the whole, during the whole trial hearing all of the heavy stuff you were hearing i was able to go decompress i would go out at lunchtime uh while you guys ate and talk here to our hidden gems right. and to our audience and share with them what i was feeling and what i had just heard right. you were in lunch with a bunch of jurors not allowed to even talk to each other about the case right isn't that right it, it is right. We couldn't talk. And if, if we even sounded like we might be talking about something, we would get reminded not to because possibly yeah. somebody would overhear or whatever. But it was hard because we would go into a really impossibly small jury room. There's one table with everybody sitting around. Um, it was nice. There was a window looking out in the mountains. Um, but that was hard for me to just be kind of stuck in that room all the time. I think we spent as much time as that in that room as we did in the courtroom, probably. And you couldn't talk about what you were listening to. I, I think John, as a psychologist, would say that's a really great way to make trauma uh, even worse. I think you yeah, know, we all got a lot. Stuff it down, yeah. stuff it down, and don't talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> we talked about everything else, and that well, was yeah. What would you talk about? That's another question people have. That's a question in chat. Would you talk about sports, politics? Like, what do you talk about? Yeah. The weather. No, we, I think we avoided politics because we all realized we're 18 strangers and who knows where everybody's politics are. I think it became kind of clear through just personalities by the end where people were politically. And it's, mm -hmm. you know, I think there was a good mix in there, which is great. 
but it's probably good that we avoided the subject. <laughs> so we talked about kids, grandkids, you know, the weather. We could look out and slowly see the snow receding up the mountain as, you know, it was springtime and starting to get nice outside. See, um, I, I, that's what I said. I said the weather. He, Thanks for confirming that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, so... I, sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off there, Tom, but I'm, I, I think I don't want to lose what I think what Lauren is partially getting at there is the emotional impact. Did it having to deal with that level of trauma of, yeah. of um, pain, yeah. suffering yeah. every day for yeah. six weeks and, and not being able to process it with anyone? I mean, what? Yeah. It was harder for me than I would have thought it would be. Um, but I think I was kind of in the role, I guess, of I was older. And I think, I don't know, there were some people that were really struggling. And so I kind of took on the role maybe of comforting them a little bit. And that probably helped me, I think, more than they, they probably were helping me as much as I was helping them. Because I wasn't outwardly crying like some of them were, but it was still, you know, inside. You can't hear and see this stuff without having it affect you. So that that's fascinating to me. You're, you're saying that members of the jury would, when you were excused for lunch, for example, that some of them would be in tears, some of them would be... Occasionally, not always, but, you know, there were some pretty tough days, and I think they were probably in tears before they left the courtroom. I couldn't really see. You know, there would be beside me down the row or whatever or in front of me with their backs to me. But by the time we got out of that courtroom, there were definitely some tears. Interesting. Yeah, and I and I saw tears as well. So they they continued in the back room then. Yeah. There was one juror in particular that I was concerned about. She was very young, and I, I really didn't think it was fair for her to have to go through that. I don't think she was equipped for that kind of thing. It's a lot to go through for somebody who doesn't have that kind of life experience. But I think so. We you were you were you were more concerned about the other jurors over here. That says a lot about you. Yeah. Yeah. You knew you could handle it, but you weren't sure if the others could. Yeah. Uh, the, the, this is a question that that the chat is asking, and I think it's a question I've heard again and again. So let's just uh, visually, I saw a wide range of ages ethnicities, but there were some things I, I couldn't see. Um, I've let the chat know that you are not Mormon. It's a question that people ask because this is a religious case in the sense that there is a religious motive involved. Right. Was Do you know if there was a variety of religions with all of the jurors there? That's a question in um, chat. I could tell you out of the 18 people in there, I think I knew one of them was Mormon. The, the rest, I have no idea. Yeah, at Boise is often surprisingly diverse too, and people yeah. don't always yeah. realize that when it comes to Boise as someone rest. that lived there. Yeah. yeah, I lived there and I reported there, and it's a lot more diverse than people yeah. realize. I talk about that a little bit in my book, and um, I came from a very Mormon part of Idaho, and a very small town, very isolated town, and it was kind of dysfunctionally Mormon in my opinion because it was so isolated. <laughs> And right. they controlled everything, and it was hard for me to be there, do business there and stuff. So uh, coming to Boise has been kind of healing for me in that way, I think. That's, thank you for sharing that. Was there was there any um, – well, go ahead, John. Did you want to follow? I know that you had some questions you really wanted asked. Uh, you know, in talking about the emotional impact of the trial on the jurors, uh, I think I wanted – I was thinking of – an important question to follow that up with would be what were do what were the most emotional moments during the trial for you are those are those things that you would um be willing to talk about yeah um for me personally um leading up to and finding the bodies it was kind of for me like um if you're watching a horror movie or something you know it's leading up to this um, you know, it's coming, but um, I didn't know what things happened to get to that point, right? So I'm watching it all or hearing it all in court um, through the witnesses and everything. 
what led up to all that. And then we get to the point where the, I, I think listening to um, Detective Hermosillo and some others talk about that day, that was probably the hardest thing for me to think about. That, that really made me start to think about the living victims as much as anything else. And by living victims, I mean the police, um, everybody involved, not just the family and people who were close, but people who got close over time got really involved in this. And some extremely dedicated people, I think, that really stuck to this and followed it through. I, th I think that was probably the hardest thing for me to deal with was just thinking about those people. Not that, I mean, the, the victims who were murdered, that's the worst thing, but they were gone. And these other people were still living and suffering. Were there any specific people or specific test testimony that you found particularly compelling or more emotional? Um, some of it was, I, the, the, the really strange thing for me turned out to be that all of the FBI, the detectives, all the professional people, the medical examiners, all of their testimony wasn't, didn't turn out to be as important as all of Lori's flaky friends and, and the prepper people and all that, because the, the, the cops, I 100% believed what they said. They were extremely believable. They had proof to back up everything that they said. I had no question with any of that. But what it came down to was some of these other people in their testimony, that had to be important in the case. It had to actually make my mind up whether she did this or not, more than anything, because it was all circumstantial. So yes, you have this proof, that proof, and that proof, but none of that actually proves that Lori was behind it all. But the testimony of some other witnesses, Zulema and Audrey and you know people like that, that turned out to be, those were the important witnesses for me. Yeah, interesting. Um, important, could you be, could you go a little further with that thought? Important in, in what way specifically? Well, because the the police and all their technical stuff that they did and uh, ways that they proved what happened, they didn't really prove that Lori was behind it, right? Because she wasn't actually at the murder scenes on any of those murders. It was, um, she conspired to commit murder, which is murder in Idaho. So it, those things didn't prove it, but what did prove it was, um, I can't think of, offhand the specific things that were said by people like Zulema, but taken as a whole, it was enough to convince me that for sure she was behind this. She caused this. She did this. Gotcha. That's You know, that really took a while to dawn on me that that's how, the way I was going with, you know, sitting in court. But by the time it was all over and I was sitting there thinking about all this stuff, I realized, wow, you know, these people that I was like, I couldn't take anything they said very seriously. It turns out that their testimony is what proved to me that he was guilty. Did you, so sometimes this group has been referred to as a cult. Did you, did you start seeing it that way or how, how did you see this group? You know, I was at the time sitting in court. I couldn't tell you I, that I saw it any particular way. I, there was so much that I didn't know. Now, for sure, I see it as a cult. Okay. I think it's part of a bigger cult, in fact, too. That, I'm sorry to jump in here, but that leads me to ask a question. One of the things you said the first time we met Tom um, in our interview at the sentencing, you did say you, you weren't sure if Lori really believed it. And, and maybe I'm jumping ahead but I'm curious what you think now. <laughs> um, I kind of have that question for you guys, actually. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, I jumped ahead then. We'll ask it. We'll ask that in a minute. That's okay. Go ahead, John. 
Yeah, that's interesting. So, I mean, you're you're really describing sort of two different versions of this trial. There's the the technical element uh, with law enforcement and detectives and all that kind of stuff and timelines. And then there's more of the, I don't know, let's call it the emotional element of group members or let's call them cult members and how they work together and how they, their belief system. And it sounds to me like that second component may have been a little more influential. Well, it was because like I said, I, I believed everything the police said. Um, you yeah. know, I knew the bodies were buried in Chad's backyard. You know, everything they said was, they proved it all, but it didn't necessarily prove that Lori was the one behind it all. But listening to all the other witnesses and just the, the accumulation of it all, is what did it for me, I think. Not just listening to one particular one. It wasn't like this aha moment where a witness said something and I went, oh, that's it. It was just all the evidence put together. Well, and on that issue, what, what did you think, what did you think the most compelling pieces of evidence were? Is that something you've thought about since? Um, not really. I haven't thought about it that much, but I think um, some of it, you know, they brought the rifle into the courtroom, the one that was supposedly used to shoot at Tammy. That didn't affect me much because, to me, they didn't really prove that that was a rifle. Um, I think they were trying to impress us with the rifle. Okay. Uh, but I, I did think that the prosecution was pretty believable in that pretty much everything else they said and did. Yeah, what on that issue? What what did you think the prosecution did the best, or what did, what did the prosecution do well with? You know, I think they were so sure of themselves. Okay, I, I really think that was a lot of it, but it it, it wasn't just that. I mean, their, their their evidence that they presented, and they you know a lot of times it was monotonous. They presented it over and over in different ways. They spent more time than I needed on a lot of things, but I understood why they needed to do that. Um, but the, they were pretty convincing as far as this is the evidence that we have that these kids were murdered. It just didn't all necessarily lead quite up to Lori. And without, what, what a, yeah. without the testimony of their other witnesses, they were still their witnesses. They were all their witnesses. Right. But just from the prosecutor, from the police, detectives, FBI, all those. And I, I guess I would ask you, I should ask you if I'm asking about the prosecution, what what did you believe that the defense did well with? You know, I think they did well to um, give her the opportunity to have her day in court. That's That's what she gets, right? She's guaranteed her day in court. And I think they did their best. I don't think they did. There wasn't much they could do, so I couldn't really say, "Well, they did this really well or that really well," because there, there wasn't much they could do. They they tried to cross-examine witnesses. I think the prosecution preempted a lot of their questions. That's that's one thing. The question you asked me before that the prosecution did really well when they called a witness to the stand and questioned that witness. They asked the questions that they thought the defense was going to ask them also before the defense could get to that. So by the time the defense stood up and came to cross-examine, there wasn't a lot they could ask. I think their hands were, were really, really tied. I think some, some by Lori, they, they were, and also by the fact that they couldn't, um, insanity is not a defense in Idaho. So they couldn't, right. even, they couldn't even talk about it. I think a lot in court. So. Yeah, on that issue, by the way, and obviously, so that that's getting in a little bit into my area. Um, do you do you feel like it would have been more compelling if they brought in some mental health issues or evidence around mental health? I think they could have made a compelling argument in the defense that she was crazy. I mean, if if it were a state that had that as a defense, I I don't know if I could have convicted her because I think she's pretty crazy. She would okay. have to, right. <laughs> Okay. You were shocked. You were shocked by her uh, statement at sentencing because you didn't you didn't understand sort of how deep this went, belief wise, right? Because you had you'd never heard from her at trial until the I sentence. Never heard her speak before until that moment. 
Um, so yeah, that was that was really something. I couldn't believe I was offended by a lot of what she said, and I think a lot of other people were too. I think she tried to compare us all to her by saying, you know, who would throw the first stone or yeah, that, that didn't go too well with me. And I'm I'm sure the the detectives and everybody else in that room were pretty upset by that one too. But um and, and she went on to say some pretty weird things. <laughs> Yeah. And, and you know, I, so at that point, I'm really questioning, like, okay, she's either crazy or she's making herself sound crazy. <laughs> but why would she do that at this point? She's got that at the game now. You know, she'd talk like that in court, maybe. She was kind of crazy and we might have, I don't know, it wasn't a defense anyway. But. Right. Or maybe maybe she's setting up something for an appeal. Yeah, right, right. So when when you when you talk about the defense uh, that way, Tom, it it almost sounds like you're saying that the the defense really sort of had a bad hand. You use the hand word, by the way, not in that context, but uh, they they were kind of belted. You know, they were dealt a, a bad hand. Um, when you say that, uh, you know, it makes me wonder. At what point during this trial did you sort of feel like the outcome would be clear? Were you were you experiencing that fairly early, or do you did you kind of reserve judgment until the end? I, I reserved judgment till the end. I was trying to, you know, be a good juror and be fair. You know, my my, I guess on the surface, feeling about it all was she's guilty and she needs to go down um, pretty early on. But I was still trying not to let myself think that way or feel that way, and you know. I would have been able to if they had come up with any kind of defense that made sense to me in, in spite of all of the everything that was against her if, if i didn't think she was guilty i would say she was not guilty but there was not really any question you know at least halfway through the trial i would say when you think about it now is the do you believe that they're they're uh, there could have been a defense that would have worked more in her favor. I mean, is is there something that? No, I don't. How can you? How could anybody defend her? I think <laughs> okay. those guys, you know. So that was one of my questions coming out of this, and okay. I, looked, I looked into them, and they're very qualified defenders with a, a really good past. They've got a lot of yeah. experience. She was well qualified. She was well represented there. I just think there wasn't a whole lot they could do. I was really surprised when they didn't call any witnesses, but looking back on it, I, who would they have called? Yeah. I mean, I, I think they, they did a very good job given what they had. I agree. I do too. Do you, so you, you mentioned you were at sentencing. Um, do, do you think, do you think this sentence was just, do you think it was fair? Yeah, that was interesting because um, when Judge Boyce started speaking as he was leading up to his actual sentencing at the end, he had me kind of nervous. I was, you know, he was sounding like he might go easy on her, talking about her past and how exemplary it was and um, made me start to think, oh, man, he's going to find a way to go light on her. And I didn't know, but that didn't happen, obviously. The sentence was everything that I was hoping for at that point. I was hoping that there was no way she was ever going to see the light of day. And okay. Yeah. What about, did you, did you have thoughts about, you know, even though the death penalty was taken off the table, did you have any thoughts about that? Yeah. So I've had a lot of thoughts about that. Even okay. though I was not confronted with that outright, I was confronted with that in my own mind. Like, okay. And how would I have felt about that? So yeah, I thought a lot about that. What are, could you, could you talk a little bit about your, I think, yeah, I think the people in the Chad Daybell trial are going to struggle with that. The, the jurors are going to struggle with that more than they realize because by the time this trial was over, um, I kind of thought, well, you know, I hope, I wish she could have gotten the death penalty. I wish there could have been more justice there, but then I had to really think about that. Like what is more just for her? Is it more just for her to, um, and I, I talk a lot about this in my book, actually. There's like a whole big, long chapter on this because I, I did think a lot about it. But is, is, 
is it better for her to spend life in prison and maybe at some point she'll be confronted with what she did? Maybe reality will sink in and she'll have to deal with that. Or if she had been given a death sentence and her death was imminent, would that have been more just? Would that have caused her to come to terms with it sooner? Maybe to ask forgiveness, um, uh, maybe not to us, but to God or whatever, to, you know, I don't know. It's a tough one. Yeah. Well, now, now I want to read your book. So, <laughs> which many people are asking about your book in chat. So, will you share the title one t- uh, one more time? It sounds it sounds like YouTube might be blocking uh, the title of your book when people oh. write it in chat. It could okay. it could just be one oh. of the words in it. Okay. Uh, so will you share the title of your book and explain to people that it's not available yet? We'll we'll share why. But yes, what is the title? Oh, it's book? Money, Power, and Sex: The Lori Vallow Daybell Trial by Juror Number Eighteen. And it, it won't be released until the Chad Daybell trial, until there's either um, a verdict or a plea agreement in that trial. So probably around the end of May, that's what I'm hoping. It'll be available. Okay. And and I want to ask you why you chose to go to the sentencing, because you did not need to go there. It, it is also, people don't realize this, but Rexburg is, despite being in the same state as Boise, ours away from each other. And you went there with several other jurors. Yeah, there were three three others there. Um, it was really important for me to see it through. It, it, it was important enough, my grandson was born that night and I knew he was due to be born that night, um, the night of the sentencing and I wouldn't be there, but I, I needed to be there. And I'm so glad that I went because some things happened to me there that I wasn't expecting. So I drove into Rexburg, I drove out to, I had to drive by the Daybell property. And when I drove by there, I was, I sat there, I pulled out, there's a little turnout there. I pulled out by myself, there was nobody else out there. And I just kind of looked over. I knew the property really well from seeing the pictures in court of, of where the grave sites were and everything. So I could look out and I could see where Tylee had been buried and I could see where JJ had been buried. And all, I could imagine Chad parked out front and all the things that went on there. And it was kind of a somber experience for me. And, you know, I sat there for a while and then I drove off and then I, you know, I went to the hotel and ran into two of my fellow jurors there. And they were disappointed that I had been out there and they wanted to go out there, but they wanted me to come with them. They didn't want to go out by themselves. So, uh, I, you know, I really didn't want to go back out there, but I went back out there and I'm so glad that I did because this time, um, the turnout that I had parked in by myself earlier was full of people and um, media was there and they made a little monument to Kylie and JJ there and um, Kay and Larry were there and I had talked to them on the phone prior a couple of times and um, I kind of stood there and just stood back for a while but then I thought I would go introduce myself and I was kind of nervous to do that but I, I wanted to, I just felt compelled to. So I did, and they immediately pulled me in and hugged me and thanked me and just made me feel so good. Those those people who have been through so much were concerned about me, and I'm a complete stranger to the thing. It doesn't affect me personally, really, not like it does to them. And so that really meant a lot to me. And then I got to meet you, Lauren, and, and everybody else after that. And so it turned out to be a really good thing. It, I, now I know why I went. But I didn't know why I was going. <laughs> I just felt like I had to. Yes, and I understand that the being present. Uh, now that we've learned that Chad's trial will be live streamed, we've considered staying home and watching it here. But th- I understand exactly what you're saying. There's a part of being there that's really important to be able to experience something. And so, I, I certainly think that I'll be attending some, right. if not all, of Chad's trial now. And I hope to to see you there. Oh, you will. Yep, I'll come see you when, whenever you're there. I'm not going to go watch the whole thing or anything, but I'll be I'll be following it pretty closely on TV because I plan to do a follow up bug on that trial. Because yeah. there's a lot. Let of me, sh- yeah. Let me share a little bit about uh, uh, Tom's book that I know about, uh, so that so you guys can hear this. And, and and by the way, we're we're we've got a big show tonight because Tom has questions for Doctor John too. So stick with us, everyone. But uh, <laughs> there was one moment. It was after the sentencing. I think it was that evening 
Um, I remember I reached out to you because the producers for News Nation wanted to talk to you. And you were going on, and we were all in the same hotel and we were all in the lobby together. I mean, I, I don't know if I should be naming all names because some people probably want their privacy there, but many of us, right? Many of us were there. Uh, many, yeah, and many people affected by this case. And Justin Lum and I are sitting there chatting and we're looking over at you far in the corner at the other table, uh, talking with Detective Hermosillo and interviewing him. And you had your pad of paper out and you were taking notes. And Justin was like, dude, how'd he, how'd he, land? <laughs> how'd he get to do that? And, uh, and I know exactly why you did. You, you served in a, you did not want to do this. You did this, you sat through this and, uh, you, I know that that trip to Rexburg, you interviewed detective Hermosillo, you interviewed the prosecution. You have many, many interviews that, that many do not have, including reporters. Many and time. yes, yes. Yeah. You had us going, what the heck over there in the corner? Uh, no, we were, we were excited and, and, honor it, 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 it was touching it was touching to see him talking to you a juror number 18 maybe another one that really just made me feel good was... yeah but that is also why your book cannot be released until after right. chad's right. verdict and i think that's what we need to explain here the draft is done but it, because of the sensitive interviews you have it simply cannot be released i just until finished after and I have a publisher, and so it's going into editing right now. Um, there's, yeah, there's some things I'd like to tell you about it, but I'm not sure if I'm supposed to yet. So I'll just wait, I guess. You just wait. You just yeah. wait. But well, I have to jump in here. You you keep mentioning Chad, so I yes. can't miss this moment. There was a lot of evidence presented that involved Chad. Yeah. And. I have to ask you what your impressions of Chad Daybell were when you were listening to all the evidence and, you know, did, did you formulate any opinions on Chad and, and what the evidence might mean for him? Yeah. So sitting through the trial, I was questioning that exact thing. I, I wasn't okay. sure. Um, I have a definite opinions now, but at the time you're asking how I felt during the trial, I think and at that time I, I wasn't sure. I mean, I, I, were they both just as guilty? Was was, I mean, as far as I was concerned, Lori had let her kids be killed at the very least, right? So to me, that's her mother. She's guilty. But so was Lori just guilty of following along with him? Was he the mastermind behind it all? Was she the mastermind behind it all? Or did they come together in this horrific chance thing where two really miserable human beings come together and do horrible things? Were they both capable of it before they met each other? I don't know. I didn't know at the time. Did you, did you feel like some of the evidence presented that involved Chad was, was fairly damning to him? Yes. So yeah. would, would it be fair? Yeah. His Go conversation ahead. with the uh, um, crematorium, I guess, in uh, Arizona, yeah, that was all. The funeral home. We played that on our channel yesterday. Yeah, yes, Chad right. calling the funeral home after Charles's death. Yeah, that was really something. Chad DeBall, whatever. <laughs> yeah, it's it's. I guess it's now become a part of his best hits. I, guess, I mean, he uh, came up with all these zombie names, and he couldn't came, come up with a name for himself rather than Chad DeBell. Sorry, I have a hard time even with people like Chad to be critical, especially you know with the whole audience watching, but. That guy's a moron. He's not very smart. <laughs> Better you saying it than us. Yeah, that that wouldn't. That's this is exactly why we had you on because we can't say stuff like that. Yeah, and, as and, uh, and say professional. Right. right. Rebecca Randall gave us a good one too. Chad Dubell. Dubell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, what's, what's your professional word for uh, moron then, Dr. John? <laughs> <laughs> it's not a diagnosis no. in the DSM, but um, it's it's a word I've heard a lot in this case. So, um, But I think you're the first person we've had on that said that. So um, 
I'll, I'll, I'll accept it. Part. I'll accept it as your diagnosis. Yeah, there you go. The layman's <laughs> diagnosis. The best word I can come up with. Low, low IQ. <laughs> <laughs> That'll be your diagnosis in the book. And by the way, I should mention about the book that the profits are going to be donated to a nonprofit organization called Hope House. Could you could you tell us a little bit about Hope House, please? Tom? Yeah. So I spent a lot of my time since the trial looking for the right uh, organization to donate money to. If I'm fortunate enough to, you know, write a good enough book and actually make some money, the profits are going to go to the Hope House, and the Hope House is. Um, it's in Marsing, Idaho, a small town just outside of Boise and right on the Snake River. They take in children who most of the children um, have been adopted. And some of them were adopted from outside of the United States and came here as part of their adoption. And the families, for whatever reason, didn't follow through, couldn't, couldn't hang on to the kids. The adoption didn't work out. Um, so, the, you know, they're here in this country with nowhere to go. Parents don't want them anymore. Their adoptive parents don't want them anymore. And so the Hope House takes them in. And we got to meet some of the kids and do a tour of the place and meet the directors, uh, Donna and Ron. And they're awesome. And they do everything good there. And I'm really happy to have found them. I think it's it's just the right place, just what I was looking for. Because they help kids who otherwise could be in some serious danger. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. I, I noticed that Kay just Kay Woodcock just jump on. So uh thanks for joining us, Kay. We're we're happy to have you here tonight. Thank you. Kay says, Hello everyone, John Lauren, and a special hello to you, Tom. Hello, Kay. Very nice to hear from you. Glad you're listening. So let me I'm gonna shift gears a little bit here because I know you you want to ask me a few questions, I guess. I um, to it. Okay. So, uh, I'm, I'm going to put you on the hot seat here for a second though. So, um, you know, you had mentioned when I'm glad I asked you about the vetting process, but when you were, when you were being considered as a juror early on, you said that the only thing you knew about this case was that it was a sordid and sad case. And that was one of the reasons you didn't want to get involved or to follow it. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, it strikes me that if that's how you felt before, and then you obviously became a juror, that that I'm 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 imagining or, or guessing that that this trial probably had a big impact on you in some way. Um, could yeah. you talk about that a little bit? Yeah, um, more than I want to admit to myself. I think. Okay. Uh, more than I was expecting it to. I knew it was going to be hard when I found out what it was. Um, my wife says I've, I've changed. There's something different about me. She can't quite explain what it is, but it, it, I feel it. You know, there's something a little bit different. It's it's not that I've like lost hope in humanity or anything like that. I I think the opposite is actually true because she was the only bad player in that room, and so many good people were there. That by the time the trial was over and I'd been through sentencing and um. I've been associated with all the people that I got associated with. I think I had a better feeling about our justice system, um, about the media, uh, everybody involved besides her. So it wasn't so much that as maybe it's just um, being confronted with that. It, it, it just hurts something inside of you. It kind of breaks something maybe. I don't know quite how to say it. Not broken but a little part maybe is kind of taken away. I can imagine how people like Kay, Kay you know, people so close to this, something huge has to be broken. Well, I guess, does that answer your question? Yeah, uh, yes, it does. Thank you for, for being so open about that. Uh, it seems to me that perhaps I'm just, th this is, I'm interpreting here, but I guess that's what I do as a psychologist. But um it sounds like maybe that that initial sadness you talked about maybe that maybe that grew a little bit. It's it sounds like maybe there was there was some real sadness from being a part of this process, and and maybe that's true of all of us that yeah have it followed this case. Nothing else. 
And and the court offered counseling for jurors, and I know there are some jurors that are taking advantage of that. I have not. I I think my idea once I decided to do this book, I thought you know this is what's going to kind of heal me and get me through all this, and and it has in a lot of ways. But I'm still kind of considering it. I might take advantage of some counseling at some point. Okay. Um. Yeah. And so I guess the the last thing I would ask you is, you know, do you do you feel like I guess you've kind of answered this in various ways, but um, any takeaways for us? Any any kind of thoughts about not only how it's impacted you, but just thoughts in general about this case? Or a lot of takeaways. Okay. Uh, the main I mentioned before, but the main probably more than once, but the main one was I was I actually was pretty proud, very proud of how the justice system worked, uh, the people within the justice system, both both teams, the prosecution and the defense, uh, and looking into them since the trial has been over, you know, my opinion of them in court was correct. They are top notch at what they do, top of their game, good people, um, you know, everybody involved. I got to, when the sentencing was over, we got invited into the judges' chambers afterwards, which I was not expecting. So I got to spend about 45 minutes with Judge Voice and his his clerk and his wife. Um, I really appreciated that. That was, you know, that was a privilege. And we had been isolated from him the whole time. I mean, we weren't allowed to speak, of course, or have any contact at all during the trial. So that was really nice. And there was just a lot of that kind of thing. A lot of concern for the jurors um, that really came through and showed and made us feel appreciated. Um, so that was my main takeaway. Uh, you know, I, I guess it's kind of opened my eyes to a lot of the bad things going on and then doing a lot of the research for the book and delving in deeper to a lot of things, listening to you guys' podcasts and some other ones. Realizing that there's, you know, there's quite a lot of bad things going on in the world. You know, I, I guess my eyes have been kind of opened up. I, I guess I kind of always knew it, but I just didn't pay attention to it as much in the past. So didn't really deal with it. But, so, yeah, a little bit of that. Yeah. Okay. I'm, I'm not sure that's a great takeaway, but, but, I, but I hear you. Did you pay attention to crime stories at all before being a juror? I know that during, you know, you didn't know about this one, but was that something you paid attention to? Um, you know, I like to read and like, you know, I've read books like Truman Capote's In Cold Blood, but these were, you know, crimes from way back in the past, whatever. Um, I like to read about Dillinger and, you know, all the bad guys during the depression and things like that. So yeah, I kind of, I guess, but, but not like uh, people who are in the crime world nowadays, you know, it's, it's a big thing now, true crime and everything that's going on currently. I never was involved in any of that or interested in any of that until this. Until this, that, that was my next question is John has the belief that really um, delving into crime and true crime really is touching upon a part of humanity that many people maybe don't always explore and it can teach us about humanity in a, in a unique way, sometimes a dark way, but yeah. to, to see both. And so I was curious if, if the until now sort of answered my question, if it has sparked your mind a little bit to understand crime and how the unfathomable can happen sometimes. Right. Yeah, and you know, doing my research into this, I come across other things and get interested in other things that are going on. Um, I, I found out that a guy that I used to know, um, he was a county sheriff, and he, he had written a book. I didn't know. I had haven't had contact with this guy for like thirty years, um, but I found out he he wrote a book about some of his experiences as a sheriff, and so I got into reading that and just things I would have never found otherwise, I guess. And, and mostly, though, um, as it relates to the book I'm writing. So I don't have a lot of time to dig into other crimes that are going on. But
but if it has something, anything to do with this, or it can help me understand in any way what happened in this case, then I'm interested in that. So I've, I've been kind of following, reading, whatever stuff, stuff about it somehow relates. Yes, as S.L. Conley just wrote here, after true crime touched my family, it changed the way I parent. It's always in the back of my yeah, mind. It does. It makes you think a lot more, <laughs> for sure. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> John, yeah. maybe that's maybe that was one of your first questions for John. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I <laughs> right. It's a, that's a big question. Um, so you're you become more interested in true crime, but mm -hmm. I, I don't suspect that you're binge watching. Netflix true crime documentaries either. No, only the one that had to do with this case. Okay. <laughs> gotcha. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> that makes sense. Um, so th those are pretty much the questions I had. If, if you want to. Well, Patty G is asking what remaining unanswered questions does Tom have? And maybe that's a great segue right there. All right. You guys ready? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm I'm sitting down, but yeah. Okay. My questions are not simple. I mean, these these are things that I've struggled with and have not been able to answer for myself. Okay. I'm hoping, Doctor John, that you can help me with this. And also, Lauren, this first one especially. Um, I'll just I'll ask. I'll start to ask the question. We'll see how it goes. Um, I'm wondering how does Mormonism transfer. Um, to Mormon fundamentalism and just religious fanaticism. And I ask that not just because of the this particular trial, but because of all the things that I've learned that are going on, that have been going on in Southern Utah, Northern Arizona, the preparing of people, a vow, all those kind of things. So I've gotten kind of curious about that. What leads us to, to that? Well, first off, I'll say I might turn the basis of this question actually over to John, surprisingly, because if you ask me, I, I might give you an eight-hour podcast like the one I did over on Mormon Stories and tell you all about it, um, how it, how it can shift. But I actually consider your question more of a psychological one in how can beliefs, because I think the question you're asking is the question that lingers has lingered with me for the past four years. I'm, I'm working on a book proposal about that very question right now. Right. And a, a lot of that, a lot of my questions, you know, I think John really helped me with them. How can, at what point does a belief become a delusion? And at what point, why does a, a religion, how does the religion create the fringe? I guess I could ask specific, I could answer a specific question about Mormonism, certainly, oh. or specific parts about that. Well, that's the thing, because I'm not Mormon, and I, I actually write some about this in my book. Um, I have a lot of friends that are Mormon, and I respect them, and I respect their religion, and I, and I don't want to be critical of, of that. But I think the question needs to be asked, how, how we get from the, like the conventional Mormon church to people that are out there just kind of taking a fanatical view of it all. Kind of going yeah. off the fringe. Well, I'll answer the Mormon aspect. And then, John, I think a broad answer about religion would be great coming from you. As far as the LDS religion goes, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, I, I use the term Mormon as a, as a movement. It starts with Joseph Smith, but there are breakoff groups of Mormonism. And the mainstream Mormon church is called the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints the LDS church, that is what Lori and Chad belong to. I think what we've seen again and again and again when it comes to the LDS church and Mormonism, that it was founded with a man who was a prophet who saw God as Jesus Christ and who then became a prophet. Of course, many religions do start with a magical sort of mystical moment like that. I don't know if Mormonism is any different, but in the 1800s, this origin story, and John is always teaching me about how important origin stories are and, and why they are, sometimes are replayed again and again. I think generational, generational 
things that happen again and again and again throughout a family, origin stories matter. And that origin story is something that we see repeated again and again, that someone is going to claim that they speak for God, that they had a vision. Chad claimed to speak for God. They had missions. He had a vision. The book Visions of Glory that I've been delving deep into over on Mormon Stories with John DeLynn, um, and who has really all, that that book has inspired Tim Ballard, who is also LDS, and it has in, it has inspired Jody Hildebrandt, who is also LDS. What all of these people have in common, I'm seeing is is a belief in being a superior being, that they are called of God, that they have had visions and that they have a mission and a purpose and they they are in charge of leading people through the second coming of uh, through Christ, all three of those people. Um, if you look at Warren Jeffs, he was FLDS, not LDS, but in that broad range of Mormonism, a breakoff group. He too took on that mantle of being a prophet and I think that where we see issues with religion is this ability for people to not just say that they're a prophet, but for people to believe that the people that say it, um, that they believe them and follow them. But as far as uh, the first question you asked me, that's broad question about how does something religious, and, and that's very beautiful to many people, become something so sinister, I think That's is more a better question way of for John. Actually, I should have framed yeah. it more that way. It's, it's not meant And that's what I've been asking for four and a half years. Yeah. So, John? <laughs> so, right. So, you, you, want, you want this answer in a minute. Um, <laughs> so, my, um, my answer, first of all, my answer would be more in terms of beliefs and not religion. I, I would take religion, extreme religious beliefs to be a subset of belief. So I think my, my broader answer will just be in terms of belief. And part of the, so part of the question is how do you radicalize someone? And I think the short answer, the best way to radicalize someone is through grievance. So um, if you take certain grievances and you add stress and you add fear and you add, if you, if you start, amplifying those grievances, then beliefs are more apt to become more extreme. And you're more likely to find people believing in say conspiracies or right. the paranormal or that kind of stuff. Um, but I think you like in this particular case, I think you have to go back to childhood issues and you're looking at like Lori, for example, was raised in a family that, that had fairly extreme beliefs to begin with. And then those beliefs become reinforced and there's, there's certain personality variables that come into play too. <clears throat> Such things as resilience. So somebody that's less resilient is more likely to move in an extreme direction. Somebody who there's a, there's something called the five factor model of personality. And one of those factors that's relevant to belief is called openness to experience. So people that are low on that variable, tend to move more towards extremism too, because they're not, they're not curious. They're not open to new experiences and to learning from those experiences. Um, so I, I, so there's a number of variables here, I think. So family culture, um, these personality variables like openness to experience, typically people that end up with more extreme beliefs, they might be a little more fantasy prone. So in this particular case, you know, people were seeing angels and talking to Jesus and, you know, that involves a certain level of fantasy proneness that you wouldn't see in somebody that's a little more grounded. Um, so th those are just some, I mean, you know, we could, some, we could, we could come on here and do probably the well, next, you know, five hours talking about this, but, but that, that would just be kind of my quick. Okay. So as far as followers, of a fanatic go, what what would you say they're missing in their lives that lets them believe in somebody like Chad or, or any of these Warren Jeffs? Yeah, so you're, you're talking specifically about Lori here? Well, I'm just wondering in general, actually, what, what somebody's missing in their lives to make them vulnerable to become a follower of somebody who has fanatical 
beliefs. Maybe I'm getting too far off the track. I don't know. Um, yeah. So, it, um, so, so usually, so the, the research on cult, there's not a huge amount of research on cults, but some of the research on cults shows that, that typically people that, that move more towards cults or become involved in cults, usually they're, they're oftentimes they're experiencing some event in their life, some type of trauma or some type of upheaval in their life that gets them questioning who they are and what they should be doing. And so a lot of the way I think of it is a lot of times you have, let's say a rupture in their life, whatever that is. And that creates a bit of a void. And the goal is to try to fill that void with something meaningful that gives them a sense of belonging and purpose. So I think that sense of belonging and purpose are really what drive cults or joining cults. And, And oftentimes that's created by something traumatic or some type of rupture or questioning of one's life path or something along those lines. I love the way you explain things. It really kind of clears. You, you say it in a way that makes it clear. <laughs> Thank you. A good way of doing that. I mean, I've been struggling with that question. Really. And kind of answered it. So. Thank you. Yeah. That's a, it's a, that's a big question. It's a tough question. Yeah, I know. Um, do you think that the book, you mentioned Visions of Glory, Lauren, do you think that that book played a big role, like a huge role in what Chad and Laurie ended up doing? I do. I think that uh, the book played a huge role. They were they were lovers of the book, but I think that the book, maybe I should frame it this way, because I've been thinking a lot about this, actually, yeah. how much influence the Visions of Glory book had. And I did a crash course on the Daybell case, um, sort of explaining some basic beliefs. And I brought up Mike Stroud and I brought up Denver Snuffer and some other influential people in the Daybell case. But when it comes down to it, all of these people were also feeding on one another. So so you take a group of people with some fringe beliefs and some extreme beliefs And they're all collecting from one another. And so at what point does this book come in? Visions of Glory isn't a 100% uh, its own creative work of art. We've learned that even that book copied some things from some other places. Mm -hmm. But this book had such a cult following and still does. And I think that one reason is the secrecy of Spencer and who he is. We know that's Tom Harrison and that Spencer was this behind the scenes sort of wizard of Oz guru that people would know of him. There was this reverence with the book, the apostolic. um, So, so Tom Harrison, AKA Spencer in the book has an apostolic friend that he keeps referring to in the book, that meaning an apostle sort of okaying this book. There's some mystery and Mm. some, excitement there. And I believe that it took the belief that this book is scripture, took all of their fringe beliefs to the extreme. It bottled them up with a nice ribbon and said, here, here is your book. Here's your, here's your scripture. And then to know that Tom Harrison had met with them, I've learned and that they really, there was a lot of reverence around him and, I think just seeing Lori reading at poolside, you probably didn't even notice that when I was I noticing it. Or did you? I remember uh, specifically sitting there and seeing the video they showed us of her getting served. And I thought, oh, she's got a religious book. Well, I'd stand to read it. <laughs> but that's all I thought at the time. And I didn't know what it was. I still haven't read it, but I didn't know what it was. And it had all these connections with all these people that are involved in all this weird stuff. Yeah. Did you watch our deep dive on that book, Mormon Stories? Yes, yeah, it's, it's long. Yeah. yeah, it's long. It's long. John hasn't even seen the whole thing. He's like, dude, <laughs> <laughs> eight hours. These questions are, though. I mean, they're not, they're like several part questions and answers. They're not easily answered. Right. For sure. And to me, I guess my biggest question coming out of it was how, not why does a mother kill her children? That was easy. How does she do it? How do you get yourself in a frame of mind to be able to do that? And I think listening to you guys a lot has kind of helped me 
figure that out. What in particular, I know you're the one asking questions, but what in particular in our podcast that has helped you the most? Not one thing. Uh, accumulation of things, like everything else in this case. There's not one thing, like an aha moment or whatever. It's just everything adds up to, you know, you talk about, Dr. John talked about um, Lori's childhood or her family, all that stuff, um, and the narcissism aspect of all of that. And um, this kind of all adds up. Still doesn't quite answer it. I don't think it can possibly be answered um, to where you get to that point where you murder your children. But it, you, you can kind of, um, on an academic level, I guess, maybe make some sense of it. Yeah, I, I think that's a good point. I think that in these types of cases, there's, there's, we can come up with reasonable explanations, but I think there's always a little bit of mystery. Yeah. That, that why human beings do exactly what they do is always going to have an unknown right. variable. And there, there's always going to be a certain amount of mystery. And in the end, none of us are going to be exactly right. And that's why, you know, that's one of the reasons we do this is because we, we want to have a dialogue with our audience and our community and the gems. And, and that dialogue is so important. I'll get, you know, Lauren jokes that after every show, people will write to me and say, oh, I disagree with you. You're completely wrong. And um, I think that's great because it, it means that we're getting people thinking about these cases and alternative points of view. And that's yeah. that, that dialogue is important. Yeah. I think a lot of people have asked why. There's a lot there. I've read, there's books, there's all kinds of stuff. Why did you do this? Yeah. I don't think that's hard to figure out, but how you get to that point where you can do it is stuff. Um, so the next big question that I have for you guys has to do with Kylie. And like I told you before we came on, it's, you know, we're getting into the dark, darkest, to me, what was the darkest part of all this? Okay. So a trigger warning maybe for yeah, anyone yeah, here. Trigger warning. It's, it's tough. Um, but, uh, listening and watching her statement in court that she gave to the police after Charles was killed brought the question to my mind how her reaction was so bizarre. And I wasn't, at that point, I wasn't even really thinking that much about Lori. I was looking at Tylee going, how is it this girl? I mean, from all that I know now, Charles was really nice to her. They had a good relationship. She didn't act like she was affected even if she didn't like the guy that he'd been killed, a 16-year-old kid would be, that would be a big deal. And she was just acting like it was nothing. And so that really raised the question in my mind about Tylee and what would make her do that. And so I started thinking about her relationship with her mother, and I started asking myself, had, has Tylee been manipulated by her mom her whole life? Is she afraid to do anything that her mom's not going to approve of? Is she, does she know her mom's a killer and she's just lying for her mom? Um, I had all these questions. Um, and the biggest question I had about her and the one that's haunted me um, ever since the trial is, did Tylee know she was in danger? Was she afraid of her mom growing up? Um, did she know she might be murdered? There was that audio tape of her in the background when Lori was on the phone and Lori called her dark and she said, not me, mom, I'm not dark. And I uh, just, uh, you know, to think that maybe she knew that what was going to happen to her is a horrible thought. So I, I'm just wondering if you have anything, Dr. John, uh, any ideas about Kylie and if she knew, she didn't know, what do you think? Yeah, that that the that incident you reference is is a frightening. It's a, it's a bone chilling moment. I think it's a really frightening moment in this case, and it it that's that's exactly the question I asked. She knows. I think she knows what happens when people are considered dark and labeled zombies, and here she is with her mother calling her a zombie. And, um, you know, it's, um, I, I think, I don't know 
Tylee well enough to really answer that question in depth. What I can say is I looked at the, I looked at the interview that she did with the police after Charles was murdered. And we did a little bit of analysis of that on YouTube. It's, I think it's still posted somewhere, right, Lauren? And yeah, that was never posted on our podcast, but J John's assessment of Tylee's interview after Charles was killed is on our YouTube channel. And I, I'll try to find my, it. My analysis of Tylee is that she's, there's a lot of turmoil there psychologically. I think you see Tylee as, I see Tylee as someone who is a bit passive aggressive. She's, I, I believe she was struggling with depression and I don't, I don't know how deep that goes and I'm not trying to diagnose that, but there's signs of depression entirely a lot all over the place. And um, I think it could be very severe, but I don't know, you know, I, I can't go too far with it. I wouldn't diagnose that unless I knew more about her, but let's just call it depression broadly speaking. Okay. So I think you have, you have someone who has potentially who has, this deep depression. And I think a lot of that is, is due to the fact that she feels somewhat crippled by her mother. Her mother was probably a bit overprotective and really didn't let her become that or didn't want her to become that independent, I think. Right. And, yeah. and so you, you have this kind of overbearing mother and yet Tylee is a very smart, intelligent, independent person who wants to express herself. And so you see this side of Tylee that's always pushing back. Mm -hmm. And I, I think he, I think he rebelled against Chad, for example. And I think he, you know, he told, he, she probably, Tylee probably told her mother, Lori, what, what she really felt. And, and, in you know, Melanie Gibb perceived her to be a rebel and not a kind child. And, you know, you, so you've got the side of Tylee that's trying to find her voice and that's really kind of fighting to have an identity and is pushing back. Um, but, but, but then her mother will, you know, she'll get sick and her mother will take her to the hospital and her mother will tell her, you need me. And I'm the one who's taking care of you and I'm rescuing you. Right. So you've got this, I've, you've got this tremendous turmoil, I think with, with Tylee. And she's really kind of fighting to be herself and fighting to find her own identity and her mother is really trying to squash that at every turn. And so I think that to me, that seems to manifest or to present itself in terms of depression. And when you, when you look at the interview that Tylee did with police, it, it, there's, to me, there's, there's, it seems that there's a lot of depression there. And um, so to answer your question, I have a lot of respect for Tylee in the sense that she was a really, smart, independent person who really was fighting for her autonomy mm. and maybe for her life to some degree. But then there was a part of her that knew there were limits to what she could do. And I, I do think that in that moment, I think she may have known the awful truth, but like most children, you're probably not going to want to believe that your mother's capable of killing you. Right. So I, I think that probably shows itself through the depression. And I think at some level she had to, she had to deny that, or, you know, I like most of us, if, if somebody told us that our parents were going to kill us, I think most of us would want to question that. That's a good point. Yeah. That, that actually helps me deal with my thoughts about Tylee. The, the other, and this is kind of out there, but the other thing that helps me with it is the idea that possibly, and the same goes for JJ, Maybe they had been drugged before they were murdered, so maybe they didn't actually know what was going on when it was happening. We can only hope. Yeah. Yeah, the most horrible thing I can think of is a kid being murdered by the people who are supposed to take care of them. The one thing I want to add about Tylee and that interview with Charles, I think uh, one of the most profound moments, besides the fact that she's she's cracking every joint in her body as she sits there, anxiety. She's wiping tears from her eyes. It's actually really interesting. She stops crying. She starts to cry and she stops it showing that emotion is being shut down in yeah. her. 
but she, I don't know if you know this, Tom, but she starts humming a song and the song she is humming is from the song from the Disney movie Moana. Did you know this? And it's how far I'll go to mm -hmm. listen to the lyrics to the song. This is all you need to know about Kylie and her life. I've been staring at the edge of the water long as I can remember, never really knowing why I wish that I could be the perfect daughter, but I come back to the water no matter how hard I try. Mm -hmm. Every turn I take, every trail I track, every path I make, every road leads back to the place I know where I cannot go, where I long to be. I know everybody on this island seems so happy. Everything is by design. I know everybody on this island has a role. So maybe I can roll with mine. I can lead with pride. I can make a strong. I will be satisfied if I play along. But the voice inside sings a different song. What is wrong with me? Wow. That is the song she is humming during that interview. That's crazy. I think that's that's what she was dealing with her whole life, trying to play a role, trying to play along, trying to please her mother. I see a codependent relationship that she had. Her mother triangulated. I believe there might have been Munchausen by proxy with her sickness. Her mother made her dependent. I've also heard from people that when Tylee did have friends and she wanted to have friends, she would say, I can't go out. My mother says I'm too sick. Oh. And there was a lot of manipulation there. Do you think Laurie was really controlling? I do. In a very manipulative way, yeah. in a way that says only I will protect you. You right. need me. Everybody else is out to get you, but I always have your back. Yeah. I listened yeah. to Dr. John's explanation. Um, I don't remember what it was called, but the, you put the baby on the blanket and, and put uh, something that the baby yeah, designed. Blanket training. Yeah. And I, I thought a lot about that. Yeah, that blanket training is <laughs> that blanket training is something else. It's it's hard to imagine that people actually do it, but yeah. yeah, if you if you want to abuse a child or or beat a child into submission without actually hitting them, I, I think sometimes they do hit them with the the right the right with the wooden what is it they use, Lauren? The wooden spoons, wooden spoon. right? Oh, yeah. yeah. I think sometimes the children are hit, but it's it's certainly a way of creating a very passive, traumatized child. Yeah. So that that helped that simple explanation helped me a lot to understand that frame of mind. Um so you want to move on to some easier questions? <laughs> yeah. Yes, please. You're you're making me sweat a little bit here, Tom. They're still really deep. They're just not, you know, relative to that. These are easier ones. Um, <laughs> do, you, do you think that Lori might have been capable of murder before she met Chad? You know, we in our our last show uh, two weeks ago, we talked about that issue. There, we were from one of our sources informed us that there was a reasonably high probability that Lori may have been present when Joe Ryan, who was one of her ex-husbands that she may have been present when he was, when he died. She saw her at his last breath or something like that. Yeah. Right? And then, right, exactly. And then there's also her sister, Lolly and her sister, Stacy. And, um, yeah, there's well, right. There's so many question marks. All these people died under strange circumstances. Um, you think she actually believes that she talks to Jesus and dead people? Yep, I do think she does. I think I she's. Think she does. I think she's very literal, and her religious beliefs are very literal. And I think she's obviously very narrow-minded. And as as you as you heard during the sentences, sentencing, you know, Judge Boyce mentioned that. One of the forensic people, one of the forensic psychologists, diagnosed her with uh, delusional disorder. So that would be that would be consistent with someone who may very well think they're talking to Jesus. So, but if that's the case, um, do you think she'll ever come to terms with what she's done, or will she always just believe that 
That's yeah. That's that's a question we ask all the time. Uh, I don't. I don't see any at this point. I don't see any changes on the horizon. I think she'll continue to be in denial for quite a while. Um, I, you know, I think over time, depending on the influences, you know, her influences in in prison. You know, I mean, it's possible she may work through some of that denial, but at the moment, I don't, I, it's pretty, pretty entrenched. Well, here's, here's, here's a little tidbit. This is, this is unknown information. This is some tea, as we say here, a hidden true crime, but it'll give you an example where her mind is now. Um, you know, we all heard her refer to her, her eternal friend, Tammy Daybell, at the statement that that was a wild moment, even for me, even, even me believing that she believes some of this wild stuff, my mouth dropped. At, I just wondered at that. How, sister, how Tammy's sister felt about her in that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and this, well, this is a bit of a trigger warning for any of Tammy's dear friends or family listening to this, um, that, you know, I've been curious about, you know, now that I know that Chad and Lori might be able to talk, I've been sort of curious and I, I reached out to some, these are good sources and what Lori is talking about behind bars these days is visiting with her dear friend, Tammy Daybell. And that's what she's been talking about behind bars presently. So um, in her mind, if Dr. John is right, in her mind, she believes she's talking to Tammy Daybell and Tammy Daybell is her dear friend in heaven. Yeah. Wow. Despite being the mistress who conspired to so if, have her if, killed. If that's true, she probably really would welcome her death. She's got a firm belief. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, yeah, we've, we've speculated on that. Right. I, I think... Well, that that goes along with her belief that she believed that the world, the apocalypse, was going to occur in uh, July July twentieth, twenty twenty, right? So, in that sense, because potentially because she had that firm belief in the apocalypse, I don't think she put as much emphasis on the you know the murders. Yeah. She, right. You know, but when those things don't happen, so yeah, how does that not blow it all up for these people? <laughs> they just think, well, it's going to happen later. Wrong you're, you're, Tom, you're trying to see this from a rational standpoint. This is, we're not talking about <laughs> we're not talking about the most rational people here. So um, it's, it's a good question, but I I think. Um, you know, that there's something we, we talk about this a lot. There's something called cognitive dissonance, which is exactly what you're you're mentioning, which you know, when when evidence contradicts your beliefs, you you basically have two choices. One is you amend your belief, or the other is you just distort the evidence. So um, you know, th these people distort the evidence so that they can live with it or they can still see themselves consistently or they can keep their beliefs. Yeah. So the way you distort the evidence is you say, well, my belief is correct, but, you know, I just got the date a little wrong. I just read a few things incorrectly. Let's go tweak those. And then, you know, clearly the apocalypse is going to occur right. in 2024 or whatever it is. So, so essentially that, you know, it, the, you, this cognitive dissonance allows people that believe that set those types of dates to continue believing in the same thing because they just continue to distort yeah. the evidence. That kind of well, it really explains why she thought she would get away with it all. She thought July 20, 2020 is a big day. And yeah. Right. And I, and I want to point out something specific about the end of end of world beliefs that they have. I think that, um, there's, if you think of it this way, some people, you know, tribulations in, in most religions and the book of revelation talks right. about many, a lot of tribulations. And I think there's people that believe the end of the world is the end, you know, everything just, you know, blows up and that's it. And then there's other people I think that are thinking the end is where the many people die 
and the tribulations begin, but they are left standing right. to then gather the remaining 144,000. So I think to put that into perspective too, that the end of the world to them was where all of the tribulations were going to happen, the natural disasters, the famine, the, right. and and the wicked were going to be killed, but they would be standing with 144,000 of the most right. yeah. righteous. Yeah. Crazy. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Bingo. Uh, yeah. Cra crazy also, by the way, crazy is not a diagnosis either, Tom. <laughs> no, it's crazy. Like Cra <laughs> crazy and moron are not valid right. <laughs> diagnoses, but, um, but I, I, you know, it's fine if you use those terms rather than me. Yeah. Or evil, I crazy, feel. moron, evil, all those, all those easy terms we just want to be able to throw out to make sense of something. Yeah. Uh, they're not, they're not in the DSM. Unfortunately. <laughs> oh Yeah. Although I should, I think you can, someone could make a compelling argument that maybe we should add crazy to the DSM, but we haven't gotten that far yet. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like a legitimate term to me. Uh, so I wanted to ask you um, about the living victims, family members, the police who had to be at the um, exhumations and all that kind of stuff. Long term, how do you think this is going to affect? Some of those people. Do you think some of them might be have, have long term problems with it, or you know, there's there's something that in my, in my field we talk about in clinical psychology, but also I guess in forensic work, we talk about the idea of vicarious trauma, and um, the idea is that by just by being close to a case like this and in say for example with law enforcement i mean the the people that actually were present when the bodies were found for example i mean that that obviously is that's not vicarious that's real that's actual trauma yeah. and so um i think the people that actually witnessed those types of things are are probably i wouldn't be surprised to see if there's some some residual trauma from those incidents or from their experiences, but, but also, uh, people like yourself, you know, that, that participated on a jury and, and really didn't know what you were getting yourself into. Um, and you're kind of forced to, to be in a cloistered situation for a while for, you know, a long period of time. Um, I think that can have a real impact. And, and you pointed that out, you talked about that. A little bit in terms of some changes you've made and maybe being a little traumatized. So I, I think, I certainly think that the, you call them living victims, that the, the living victims will, um, will be deeply impacted by this. They can't help but be, that's my thought. Yeah. Okay. Um, what do you think about Alex? His, I'm, I'm thinking mostly of him and Lori when they were kids growing up, their family. Do you, do you think that they had a sexual relationship? I mean, I guess you have to either have knowledge of that or not. There's no way to guess that. Maybe you guys know something I don't. <laughs> well, I could probably talk yeah. more freely. Do you want me to just share my, yeah. my non-psychologist opinions? Um, I think they probably possibly had a sexual relationship. I do. I think that there was, this is, this is my opinion. This is me and, and not John. I personally think that there was abuse in the household. And I think there might've been things that overstep boundaries, yeah. but perhaps it was even normal to them. That's the conclusion I've been coming to also. Um, Alex is the wife that he had for a year. Her description of what she saw when she met the family <laughs> and then she ran is kind of telling, I think. Yeah, the, the, the family has steadfastly denied that by the way. So I think I should point that out. I mean, it's, there's, do we have proof of that? No. Right. 
Okay. Does it does it seem like something untoward happened during their childhood? Yeah, probably. It certainly seems that way. But yeah. well, how do you think you could have been convinced to actually be the the actual physical murderer? I, I, you know, I, I think there was, I think there was a lot of codependency with Lori. People have, there's probably some history of dependency in that relationship. I guess the the pop term would be codependency, but I think the term I would use would be deep dependency. And Alex was very literal also in his beliefs, and he was a bit of a true believer as well. So uh, I don't think it took a huge amount of convincing to get him on board and that makes sense for Chad to, to kind of see him as the ideal kind of an ideal follower of his yeah. belief system. He was a true believer also. And that's, although it does seem like he was questioning it at the end before, before he died. Yeah, he, a little bit. Although the, um, the blessing, the, the blessing that Chad gave him, might indicate otherwise, but yeah, there, there might've been, you're talking about Zulama, right? There might've been a little bit of there some question marks. He said something, I forget. It was like, I'm either a man of God or I'm not, I'm either their fall guy or I'm not. Yeah. I might right. be their fall guy. I'm either a man yeah. of God or yeah. I am not. Yeah. Exactly. It sounded like it was according to Zulema, according to Zulema in her police interview, she stated oh. that this is, yeah. What he said at the end. Yeah. yeah. So according to Zulema, so Maybe he's yeah. Not. No, yeah. <laughs> well, even even Lori, you know, if you think about the the Melanie Gibb call, even Lori questioned Chad a little bit. I mean, it didn't last, but even Lori apparently said something to the effect of either Chad Daybell is a prophet or the what he like the biggest devil that there ever was, or something like that. Oh, I so, hear that. Hmm. Interesting. So I mean, I you know it. I think that's an interesting element of this case is that some of the biggest players had moments of questioning and moments of kind of self-reflection that where they were able to stand back a little and, and wonder if this was real. Um, unfortunately for us, though, those moments didn't last very long, I guess. Right. Those, those seemed to be fleeting moments. So you mentioned Zulema. Do you think that it's possible that she killed Alex? Tom said he was coming with the questions, and he <laughs> has not disappointed. These are all questions that have come up. Right? Yeah, yeah. You you came in with guns blazing, Tom, but thank you anyway. <laughs> um, I uh, let's see. Um, I that's a really that's I think. Wow. Um, did you want to take that one more? I, you know, I, yeah, I, yeah, I'll take that one. I'll take that one. This is what I think after looking at the evidence and, and like everything else I say, I can't, I can't prove this. His, his autopsy is uh, a pulmonary embolism, just like everybody else in this right. case. Tammy, Eldon Clausen. Don't know if you've looked at Eldon Clausen, yeah. but I, I can send you down that. The yeah. Eldon Clausen. Watch Bernadine's interview uh, on our channel for that. I'll be, I'll be sharing that on our podcast soon. But um, I think one of two things, Zulema or, or Alex himself, I tend to lean towards Alex um, in the patriarchal blessing that Chad gave Alex that was shared in court. That was something all of us heard for the first yeah. time. We had read that, but never heard it. That was a heavy moment for oh, me. Yeah. Yeah. When, when we heard Chad giving Alex this patriarchal blessing that said that he was his, you know, his sister's protector, that he was going to be an incredible person that even in the afterlife, he would help save children. Um, and it stated that he would know when to cross over to the other side. And to me, that is a very telling line that, that Chad is almost implying. You're going to know when it's time, you're not, it's going to happen when it happens. Like most of us, when it comes to, to death or thinking about our own mortality, it's, you will know when then you throw in the fact that there was a call before his death with Chad 
Yeah. And that chat allegedly gave him a blessing from Hawaii. He was in Hawaii with Lori at the time of his death. And there was a blessing. That one, to me, like it gave him permission to die. Correct. Exactly. And then you throw in that the day before Tammy Daybell's body had been exhumed and that he was saying, I'm either a man of God or I'm not, that I might be their fall guy. He throws in to Zulema where a bag of money might be if something happens to him. He goes to Mexico prior. All of these things tell me that it was not just a natural pulmonary embolism. It might have been, and I also believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was two, a bilateral, like two. That's that's unique. So so I think believe that the autopsy says both of his lungs. So that's unusual. And I do believe, so I believe the autopsy, but what caused that? And I think there might've been something he picked up in Mexico and he might've chosen to do that himself. And, and maybe Zulema knew, perhaps Zulema knew that that was going to happen. This is another thing. All speculation, everyone, that yeah. whole thing, that whole thing right there, Lauren's opinion, no facts. Well, it, well it, I shared the evidence that took me there. I shared the evidence that took me there, but we don't know what happened. To even get further out on a limb, though, that made me kind of wonder if drugs weren't more involved in all of this. Not not like psychedelic drugs, but drugs that will kill you, that may be hard to identify, maybe in all the deaths. And that that's what took yeah. me kind of back to Tylee, thinking, you know, maybe she was drugged, hopefully. And, yeah, we can hope. We can hope. Or or the the allegedly Tammy becoming more tired before her death, even though she was also doing Zumba. So, you know, it depends on who you talk to. Right. But yeah, yeah, we can only I'm with you. We can only hope. It's it's what I Yeah. I, I know what you mean. Like you just hope for some sort of mercy. It gives me a little bit of something to hang on to, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um I understand. So on a lighter Subject, Lauren, you were at the trial every day, right? Um, yes. Was some of it confusing as it was happening to you? Like, were you able to just keep up with it right along? Or was it kind of like, well, that's a lot, trying to wrap my head around all this stuff? Well, I had I had a benefit that you didn't have. I knew a lot about the case going in. Everything that you guys, you know, were not supposed to have watched, um, I had watched and I had been reporting on it. There were particular moments that were difficult for me to keep up on when it came to the technical stuff, when they were going through the FBI cast data system, um, keeping the yeah. different phone numbers straight. But that's where I felt you guys had the upper hand because you had your notebooks in front of you with like the lists of the different burner phones. And we didn't have that. They had it on the screen, but it was so tiny. None yeah. of us could see it. So I was trying to like memorize or tweet the entire phone numbers. I needed like a graph to be able to know because, because the way they have to say it is this burner phone with this number pinged yeah. here. And then this burner phone pinged here. And they're not telling you that Alex's phone pinged here. They're telling you a phone number ping somewhere. So right. those were the moments that were really hard for me. And I've had to go back in my notes and really, really study that. So, so on those moments, I think actually you were better off with, um, what was in front of you? I didn't take a lot what? of notes. And as it was kind of getting around the middle of the trial, I was thinking that maybe I should have been taking better notes all along there. But it didn't matter because other people were doing that for me. And yeah, they, yeah. They in deliberation, um, so access to that. Yeah. But, you know, I have, an, I have the religious background and I had the reporting background and a vast knowledge about this case sitting. Yeah in there that you didn't have. So I asked, that was helpful to me. I, I was having a hard time sometimes kind of keeping up. Which parts? I mean, Which I parts? You know, a lot of uh, the detective mm -hmm. testimony, you mentioned the um, texts and emails and whatever, all that kind of stuff um, kind of got to be a lot at times, trying to understand how they could like figure out that Alex was over here at a certain time I understand all that now because I went back and studied it all and figured it out. But at the time, I was really not following all of that. But I, I got the point. The point was that they were able to figure out where he was and pinpoint it. That's all I needed to know at the time. But right. I kind of didn't understand it. Yeah, they had to. 
they had to share that in a very technical way that it, it, it was it was kind of hard. I agree. So this one's a little more conjecture. Um, but do you think that people, some other people, maybe knew the kids were dead? The Melanie's, Zulema, um, Audrey, you think any of those people might have known? That was a question actually the chat wanted to ask you, what your thoughts and what they might know. Um, so maybe we can all share. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> yeah. How could, they must have, which I'm wondering now, like, are the cops going to go after some of these people? Do they have deals? Maybe we'll never know. Right. Okay. Yeah, the, the chat has been wondering what you thought of, of particularly Melanie Gibbs or David Warwick's testimony, knowing that they were there, right? They were there that night in a, in a small town home. This isn't like they didn't like have their own wing. Didn't they it's have a nightmare? I know, I know they, I remember that they- It was uh, a nightmare. Uh, Alex walked by them with Jake on his shoulder and walked upstairs, right? Mm -hmm. And was it uh, Warwick who had a nightmare? Woke up or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's all just weird to me. Yeah, yeah. And he, and he conveniently didn't remember anything. Yeah, right. He, I mean, so either he knew what was going on or he was involved in it. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, uh, I appreciated actually the defense. The defense when it came to David Warwick or others, I actually thought that the defense did a valuable job there, pointing out their strange beliefs as well. I'm yeah. curious what you thought of that because that this would be confusing if you didn't know much about the case. I knew who David Warwick was. I was looking forward to hearing from him. I knew his story, so I can't imagine having to take all of that yeah. in for you. I but. needed time to think about, and luckily, you know, things move along slow, and then there's a break or whatever, so you do get time uh, to contemplate what you heard. And, you know, I I would think back and think, I think I was being kind of gullible listening to that witness, you know, like maybe an hour later, I was in the jury room or something, thinking back on what I heard, thinking, you know, I'm just taking that, that person's word for the truth, but who knows if they're telling the truth or not. It was not always very easy to tell. Right. And I think the defense, the one thing the defense did well is point out that did they know more by, by right. pointing out their very odd beliefs and their conspiracy theories and how united right. they were with Lori and, and Chad. I don't know if it diminished um, their testimony as much as it showed that right. there was a large group of people that likely knew more. Especially when uh, they um, cross cross examined uh, or uh, Audrey Veritiero, Veritiero, uh, mm -hmm. Audrey Veritiero, uh, yeah, I like it. I like that they, the defense is putting up a little bit of a fight there, and I thought that was good. Yeah, how did you feel about her testimony? That was that was a new one for me. I mean, I knew of her, but nobody had heard from her until that moment. Right, so that was a big one. Yeah. She hasn't said anything to the grand jury or anything going into it. That was just right. all a surprise. What did you think of her testimony when you heard it? I was kind of thinking, wow, you know, that's crazy. But then it's, I don't know who she is. Is she telling the truth? Or, and then when she got cross-examined, it was a little bit kind of like, yeah, who knows if, if any of what she said was true or not. It didn't, it didn't really matter that much to me whether she was telling the truth or not at that point. Yeah. Did you? I, I just have a quick question here, Tom. Did on the issue of all the people that seem to know that that you know, with the defense implying that there were the, the, that there were multiple members of this group that knew, did you feel like that that I think the defense was trying to do that to lessen Lori's culpability? Right. Did did you feel like that was effective in any way? No, because I felt like they were probably right. I, I think okay. that that it was a bigger conspiracy. And there were more people involved. Lori was their mom. That's okay. All. That's so okay. So in some ways, that strategy may have backfired a little bit. Right. Exactly. And you know, if being her mom, their mom. If if she had um, said like the next day, called the police or whatever, said, "Oh, my kid's been killed," and then tried to cover it up, that would be one thing. But she lied about it. She went to Hawaii and later on, she right. got married. She did all this crazy stuff and just went on with her life after. Her kids have been killed. And yeah, yeah, not not a normal response. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
I don't know how much time we have. I have more questions. Okay. Go I, for I it. I think we're okay. okay. Yeah, go ahead, John. What did you want to say? Yeah, we no, have. I, I thought we're. I think we're we're kind of getting close to winding down here, but. Um... Yeah. So yeah, a little bit close. Yeah, because of our, we're going to hit bedtime soon for our child. I can go on stuff. Probably. But keep going. I know keep there's going to be a yeah. So, okay. So yeah. Stop being ready to stop. Um, but I wanted to ask you about John Thomas. Um, why? Do you have any opinion on why he felt like he had to tell us? So I, I've looked into his background. He's an impressive guy. He's a very qualified defender. Mm -hmm. uh, but he felt for some reason that he had to tell us he was a diver in college when he was talking about himself in court. And I just thought that was kind of curious. And I wondered why did he do that? I actually don't even remember that part, honestly. Really? Um, yeah, when you brought him up, I, I thought of a lot of things and I don't remember that moment. What was the okay. context with so, that? Um, it must have been the first time that he introduced himself to the jury, I guess. I don't remember mm, exactly. They were doing introductions. You're right. They were doing yeah. introductions. I remember very, very well him describing himself as a diver in college. And, and well, yeah, okay, I'll leave it at that. But, yeah, that's enough for that. I think there, he, I think both of the, you know, I think they were trying to make it a little more personal. I think they were yeah. trying to be a little more relatable. I think they, they both did that. And, um, you know, it, it's a common defense strategy just to try to connect to the jury, I think, to make things a little more personable. And okay. I, so I think I, there, there would be no compelling reason to do that unless he's just trying to connect to the jury. Yeah, from my from my perspective as a first time juror, it seemed like out of nowhere. Okay, like, <laughs> yeah. maybe right. it's not unusual. I don't know. Um, you're thinking. You're thinking. What does this have to do with the case? Well, not just that, but why did he? Yeah, he, there was a lot of things he could have told us about himself that. Yeah, would have had a big impression on me. But anyway, uh, so. We kind of some of these we've kind of gone over. Um, yeah. So I've been watching uh, the hearings, for the Chad hearings, and he sits there like a statue. <laughs> John, is there any kind of psychological explanation for that? Thank you for bringing this up because it's a question I would also like to ask it's my weird. husband. It's so yeah. Weird. And John, you've seen this, you've seen this in every hearing, but this, this last hearing, just, so you know, John, um, cause I, I was watching it live with our gems and John was busy. Um, he's John's been dealing with a lot this week. Um, as many of you know, yeah. but, uh, so, so this was a four hour hearing, John, and you know, we see him in these spurts, but like he did not move. Like, he was like a wax figure. And he was kind of slouched too, right? He was kind of slouching. I mean, John knows what he looks like. He slouches, but he hardly moves. He's like waiting for him to blink. Yeah, I mean, I, I think my short explanation would be that if he's if he's standing there like a statue, it's because he is a statue. <laughs> and what I what I mean by that is that that this isn't someone with a lot of affect or a lot of emotion. Okay. You know, Chad is he's he's not someone that seems really comfortable with his emotions and he's not comfortable expressing his emotions. And that would be, that would not be atypical of someone who lacks empathy or someone who might engage in these types of activities that, you know, that he's, there's a detached quality to Chad Debo. Yeah. And I think that type of detachment, you know, makes committing crime, especially heinous crimes like this, um, more likely or more, more, um, probable. So, um, I, you know, it's, I mean, some of it could be a strategy, you know, some of it could be his defense attorney prior telling him, look, don't show any emotion. Try to try to act like a statue because I don't want people, I don't want the cameras to, or I don't want the public to speculate about certain, if you show emotion or if you cry or not that he's capable of that, but if, yeah. So some of it could be a defense strategy in the sense that his lawyer, his attorneys 
trying to keep a lid on any speculation about his body language. And we all know that there's now, I don't know, hundreds of YouTube channels that do body language analysis. And so every one of them would be <laughs> picking it up. Right. So, I, okay. so, so I, I think some of it could be that, but some of it I think is just who he is. That's, you know, he's, he's very statue like in his life and he doesn't express a lot of emotion and, so I think I think that's part of it. Somebody just mentioned he's a psychopath. Um, I can't definitively say that, but uh, a psychopath, if he was a psychopath, a psychopath is someone who does typically psychopaths do not express emotion. And uh, it's actually kind of hardwired in their brains that they struggle with emotion. They're able to feign emotion sometimes when it's necessary to dupe people, but they don't they don't really have emotions the way most normal people would so i can call him a crazy psychopath <laughs> <laughs> you can i can't that's correct yeah i'll let you as, get away as, with it. as colette points out uh put jason mao in front of him and then he'll show emotion he'll, he'll cry <laughs> when he talks about jason mao in his speeches but uh there's someone else that doesn't ever move and uh, we have that on our our true crime uh collection on YouTube as well. We talked about uh, John's assessment of the Tylee interview after Charles was killed, but he also assessed Alex Cox. And while he was being interviewed after Charles's death, and it is precisely the same. He doesn't move even when they leave the room. So this whole question about is John Pryor telling Chad not to move the police officers leave the room and Alex still sits in the same position. And yeah, still doesn't it. move. It's a remarkable, it's a remarkable, I don't remember how long it lasted. We took a look at it, hour, hour and a half. But yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing moment in terms of understanding Alex Cox because he really, he really is just like a statue. He has no affect, no empathy, no remorse, apparently. Um, so yeah. I haven't been around people like that, so yeah, it was something right. really for me. And I, I got to a point where I was just staring at him, waiting for him to do something, and he just didn't. It was crazy. Um, you think that part of his game early on was was he like a wannabe polygamist, or at least I think so. Think I so? think so. Yeah, but I don't even know if he had an end game. I think if you were to say to him, John says this a lot about the criminals he assesses that one of the questions he always asks them is why did you do this? And their answer is usually, I don't know. I'm, I'm telling John's story for him. He can jump in anytime he wants, but I'm going to suspect that perhaps Chad might say the same thing. I don't know if he said, well, I set this plan in motion because what I really wanted was five wives. I think that he probably would have loved five wives and he was collecting quite a harem at the end there, but I don't, I don't know if he if he knows that if that makes it's sense. Something I wondered about too with the other witnesses and the women. Was, was there more going on that we know about? I've I've heard pretty much with Julie Rowe. I know that he shared with Julie Rowe she was a a wife in a past life, and he certainly talked with Julie Rowe about Tammy dying, and he shared with Melanie Gibb that she had been a wife in a past life. Yeah, and he used that Lori. And that there was definitely another woman that he was having at the very least an emotional affair with in Arizona that we also know of that, that investigators and police were right. interviewing. So, uh, yeah. 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 It, yeah. Um, if he didn't have the conscious, conscious goal of polygamy, I think it was definitely on his radar. So it may not have been a deliberate conscious goal that he was, striving to attain but i i think it was he was clear he was clearly experimenting with that possibility i think i think Lori may have changed the equation a bit in the sense that when he meets Lori, so prior to Lori, he's flirting with a lot of different people including julio that's a complicated topic but yeah but i think when he meets Lori, Lori fulfills a lot of his fantasies and he checks a lot of boxes in terms of his so-called perfect woman. And so I, th I think at that point, maybe he wasn't as interested 
in polygamy maybe, but uh, I, but I don't know. Maybe maybe Lori would have. Who knows? Who knows what what may have happened if I was wondering about his relationship with Tammy and how much of it she was aware of. She didn't seem to be involved in any of his things other than her publishing business. I think she definitely knew about his relationship with Lori at some point, maybe late in the game. Yeah. Yeah. That might be what caused her demise. Yeah. Right. There was, there was an email exchange with Charles that seemed to indicate that she was aware of their relationship. Yeah. Well, we actually got to the end of the questions that I wrote down. I didn't think that would ever happen. <laughs> I have a lot more, but um, that was more than I thought we would get through. Well, we're getting many requests to have juror number 18 back. They they want um, Tom back. <laughs> and I don't, I don't know if you know this, Tom, but did you know that we have over 4,000 people watching with us right now live? Good thing so. I did not know that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah, I wasn't going to tell you that. Thanks. But there you go. There you go. There's the bomb drop. Surprise. <laughs> oh, that's, yeah, uh, that's, that's, good. that's significantly like more than we're in the courthouse for yes. two months. Right. Right. That's a lot. Yes. But when you People say that, very- Lauren, let's, let's, let's bring up the book again, just so, the, the, so everyone knows what the book is and when it's coming out. Yeah. Share, share your book, share your project, Tom, with All us. Right. And then, yeah. yes. Again, the title is Money, Power, and Sex, the Lori Daybell, the Lori Vallow Daybell Trial by juror number 18. And I get into, as deep as I can get into in this trial, um, not as deep as these guys, I'm not as knowledgeable about it as they are. I, I'm trying, but uh, but I get into some other stuff too that might be interesting. So I'll just kind of leave it at that. I hope people will read it. The, the profits from the book are going to a good organization that helps children in need. And that's kind of what motivated me to do this. And I'm not a writer, it's my first attempt. Um, but now that I'm mostly done with it, I think um, I'm really glad that I did it. So hopefully people will read it. We will certainly be reading it here. We look forward to it. I, a juror is such an important perspective. And the more I talk to you, the more I realize just how important your Tom's perspective is. We'll look forward to reading it and, of course, having you back. And when it's published, again, because of the sensitive nature of the people you have interviewed and the information you have, it cannot be published until after Chad Daybell's verdict. But you will be starting some pre-sales soon, perhaps, and we'll let everybody know when that happens. I'm not sure when that will be, but, yeah, I'll let you know for sure. I see that Kay is listening and I like her comments. She is. <laughs> Kay says, Tom, you've been a spectacular guest. Please do come back. Yeah. So you you came with the questions. It's not every day that <laughs> John. Right. We we didn't get to interview you. It, it was reciprocal. Oh, so it's just a yeah, huge it was for me to get this opportunity and I'm gonna take advantage of it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> well, as we shared, this is a conversation among friends, including our gems here in chat. And we're so grateful for our gems that are here and, and for also being here at such short notice, switching from Saturday, our typical night to Friday. Thank you, everyone. And thank you, everyone, for the warm wishes you've sent John this week as well. For those that know, it's been a hard week for John. And Tom, we we, we couldn't have had a, a better guest and a better conversation. This is exactly what we wanted tonight after kind of a long week for our family. So thank you. Nice. For, for being here. Yeah. Yeah. And thank you for giving us a chance to kind of look behind the curtain into the jury box a little bit. And that's, that's a rarity. We don't get to see that often. So thank you for sharing your thoughts and your perceptions and what, what it was like to, to sit there for. Yes. Thank you for trusting us. Go ahead, John. Yeah, yeah exactly. Trustworthy journalist. And I appreciate that. I'm very happy to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and and for our gems, thank you so much. Please hit subscribe. Please hit like. If you appreciated this with Tom, please hit the thumbs up or the like because it is actually how more people will learn about Tom and his book and his uh, experience. It, it will show up in the algorithms more. And thank you, everyone, for subscribing and for being here tonight. 
And uh, truly, Tom, thank you for being so open to have this very vulnerable conversation with us, with friends. So thank you. I appreciate it. Yes. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful Friday night, and we'll see you soon again. We'll see you. All right. Take care. Good night. Take care. Good night.